questions. Um, there will be people in each group who will be uh, recording all of your thoughts and questions. Um, we may not, probably won't have answers for many of the questions, but we will do our best to get answers and then we will put together some kind of a, a recap of today's uh, town hall. May 2nd, uh, that is Thursday, um, there is the National Day of Prayer Breakfast. It is at the Dynasty Banquet Hall on Calumet Avenue at 8 a.m. I encourage you to come and join. Uh, you do need a ticket. The tickets are free. Uh, contact uh, me or Brenda and we can get you a ticket. Um, I am one of the uh, participants in the event, so don't let that keep you away. But... Um, um, it was quite a joy last year and uh, such an amazing thing to have about 500 people gathered together to uh, pray and to fellowship and to uh, see the diversity of God's church in our city. On May 5th, following worship on uh, Sunday, we will have a worship committee. Um, so remember that everybody is welcome to come to that. And if you would like input on uh, what worship looks like, especially if you would like input on uh, songs that you might know, then uh, come to that so that you can guide me. Um, and uh, it is important work. For Mother's Day, which is May 12th, we are uh, collecting photos of your mothers to display during worship. Um, so please, uh, if you'd like your mother... Uh, to be honored visually, uh, send a picture to uh, Brenda in the office. And uh, if you have previously submitted one in previous years, uh, just let Brenda know that you do approve using it again. And uh, this past week and this coming week, the United Methodist General Conference is meeting. General Conference is every four years, although because of COVID, the one we're having now in 2024 is actually the 2020 General Conference. They do very important work because that is the only group in the entire church who can actually make decisions, set policy, and uh, review doctrine. So their work is extremely important. And uh, so I'm asking you to pray Pray for the general conference, pray for the delegates, uh, pray that God's will might be done through their work. And it is amazingly difficult work because there are delegates from all over the world because the United Methodist Church is a global church. And with so much diversity, um, even after the uh, disaffiliations of the past couple of years, discerning God's will for us is both a holy task and a daunting task, so they need our prayers. So now let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship as we uh, enjoy the prelude.
Good morning, everyone. Please join me in the call to worship. Easter people, we have been saved by the risen Christ, the life-giving vine. We abide in love, the life-giving vine. We are branches of the vine, sustained, nurtured, and pruned by love. We have no life apart from love, the life-giving vine. When we make our home in the vine, and the vine makes a home in us, we bear the fruit of love. We produce the fruit of love, the life-giving vine. Easter people, how shall we bear the fruit of love, the life-giving vine? We will love and learn to love as we rest, play, work, and build community and God with one another. Amen. And now, if everyone could please rise and join me in the opening hymn. To God be the glory in the United Methodist hymnal number 98. Please be seated. The opening prayer for this morning, loving God, send your spirit among us now. Bind us to you in the love of this day, that we may worship in unity and friendship. Bind us to you in love this hour, that we may be strengthened to bring abundant love to your world. In love and gratitude, we pray. Amen. And now, if the kids could come up for Mr. Mike. They get the limo outside. 
tie the shoes, every style, every color. Yeah, when you're famous, it could be kind of fun. It's really you, but no one ever discovers. Whoever thought that a girl like me could double as a superstar? You get the best of both worlds. Chill it, I'll take it slow, but then you rock out the show. You get the best of both worlds. Mix it all together and you know you get the best of both worlds. The best of both worlds. Hello. How are we all doing today? Good, good, good. You know what today is? I always like to do this. Do you know what today is? National something day. You're right. It's actually among other things, National Superhero Day. Yay. So, we might talk about that a little bit later, but for now. About 20 years ago, long time, I used to drive home from work and I would see this billboard every day. It was for a television program called Hannah Montana, and it showed, it just said Hannah Montana, and it showed like a teenage girl with wearing a long blonde wig. I had no idea what the show was about. I, I always got to kick off it and whatever. So one Saturday night, I was kind of wanting to watch a little TV and I had a little channel guy looking at it. And I noticed Hannah Montana was coming on. So I'm like, I'll give it a shot. I probably won't like it, but uh, why not? So I watched the show. I absolutely loved it. I thought it was a really fun show. I liked it so much. I made sure I like watched it every other time it came on. And basically the show was about... I think um, her name was Miley Stewart on the show. I think it's, she was like 14 when it started out. And during the day, she wanted to be a regular high school student. She lived in Southern California, just going to regular public school, living her regular life. But at night, she put on her blonde hair, wig, and she changed the clothes a little bit, and she became Hannah Montana, who was a world-famous pop star. Now, I, I brought a picture of them along, if you want to see what I'm talking about. You got that picture? You don't have the picture, okay. Well, if, if we had the picture, you would see her with the wig and her without the wig. That's okay, that's okay, well, we'll go on. And like I say, she tried to keep this a secret from everybody, and early on, her two best friends f found out her secret. And, you know, she had a lot of trouble. You know, she had trouble, you know, she had like that secret identity, kind of like a superhero would, and she, didn't want anybody to know, and she found out it was so hard to be both a regular girl and a world-famous pop star. That spoiler alert, if, you, if nobody's watched the show in the last 20 years, spoiler alert, the very last episode, she's on live TV, she takes off her wig and says, I had enough, I'm, just, I'm not going to be Hannah Montana anymore, I'm just going to be Miley Stewart, and I'm going to do that. Sound like a fun show? I think it's on, on Disney Plus now. Anybody have Disney Plus? You, you, watch, you Anybody ever see the show? You saw it before? Did I do a good job um, describing how it is? Did you watch the last episode yet? Sorry. Whoops. So have you ever tried eating with a spork? Do you know what a spork is? What's a spork? It's a spoon and a fork. Yeah, it's just kind of a spoon, but at the end, instead of being round, it has like little tips on it. And it's really hard, you know, because the tips aren't you know, sharp enough to poke anything, and it's impossible to eat soup without it running through the cracks. And I think the main problem with the spork is that it's trying to be too many things at once. It would work a lot better if it would make up its mind whether it was a spoon or a fork. You know, when I was in school, they would always give, give us these sporks when the dishwasher wasn't working. It's like, why didn't they just give us a plastic spoon and a plastic knife instead of these sporks that just, they just didn't work. And this reminds me of some people I know, you know, they want to please everybody, but end up pleasing nobody. And I'm guilty of doing this myself sometimes, you know. The problem with trying to please everybody is we can't be two things at the same time. You know, we can't be a regular high school student and the world famous pop star at the same time. You know, you have to, which one do you want to be? And we can't, you know, and, you know, we can't be a fork and a spoon at the same time. In the same way, we can't serve God and this world at the same time. We can't be doing what God wants if we are focused on pleasing people all the time. It just doesn't work, you know, like a spark. We have to make a choice. Whose side are you on? Are you a fork 
or are you a spoon? Just, just let that sink in. What, what, there, there's really no wrong answer with that one, okay? Is this, it, it, would you rather be a fork or a spoon? Spoon. Oh, that's the wrong answer. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. All right. What, 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 about, what about you, fork or spoon? A fork. Why a fork? You could poke things with it and pick up other stuff with it. Could, could you eat soup with it? Yeah, that's right, okay. So now the Bible tells us no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve to um, God and man. That is from Matthew six twenty four. Wasn't this fun? Are you going to go home and watch Hannah Montana now? It's a really good show. Yeah, you guys... Anybody here ever watched that show? Not, 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 you did? That's okay. okay. The, a few. It's, it's, a, it's a fun show. All right. Anyway, let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us to realize that doing your will is more important than pleasing people. Help us to stop getting caught up in what other people think and focus on what really matters, which is serving you. And all of God's children say, Amen. would somebody like to read our memory verse? Would you like to read it? No. All right, Sam. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Psalms 119.11. Very good. Yay. And I'm going to tag uh, Terry back in, I think. Maybe not. I promise I'm not likely to go home and watch Hannah Montana, but not saying it's a bad show, just probably not my thing. Pray for me. And speaking of prayer, so we come to the time where we uh, share with each other those things that are on our hearts, our hopes and dreams, our fears and worries, our concerns, our pains, and our loves. Let us learn that everything taken to God is in the right hands. That we can trust God with our whole lives, even though we tend to hold on to parts of it just to make sure it turns out the way that we want. It's hard to trust. It's hard to let go. So may, in our prayers today, God help us to grow in our trust of him. As we uh, sing our prayer hymn, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds, uh, please fill out in the pew cards any uh, prayer requests that you have, um, and we will uh, not only pray for those today, but throughout the week. So let us sing, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds.
Amen. So I do have to inform you that uh, Dave Hinshaw, that uh, longtime member of First Church, he passed away this past uh, week. And um, Sue Cook, that many of you know, who's a member of Ridge United Methodist Church, also passed away suddenly this week. So uh, please keep uh, Dave's family, in particular uh, Mary, but all of his family in your prayers, and the family of Sue, as well as uh, all of her friends, both at First Church and uh, Ridge. She was a regular at our uh, Bible study on Wednesdays. And also, please pray for the people who have been affected by the tornadoes. Uh, Nancy asks for prayers for her brother John, uh, who's having uh, complications after gallbladder surgery. Uh, please pray for Molly Bodie and Laura Ward, who are uh, having vertigo. Barb would like prayers uh, to help her forgive her son-in-law and grandson and the passing of her daughter, Kim. Nancy would like prayers for Linda, who is diagnosed with Alzheimer's, as well as uh, Carrie, the daughter of a friend whose cancer has returned. Bobby would like prayers for when you just don't feel your best, reminding us to touch the robe of Jesus. Amen, Bobby. Lynn would like... Um, Prayers that everyone have God in their lives, and she's grateful to the Lord for all of the provisions and bringing her back to church. And we are grateful for that as well. Uh, Pat would like prayers for Kevin Shelton, a grandson, Kevin graduating from Trinity College this week. It's a praise. <clears throat> Ansley is asking for prayers for her soccer coach who has stage 4 bone and prostate cancer. Um, and Cheryl in particular is asking for prayers for uh, Dave Hinshaw's family. Uh, Cheryl and Mary are quite close. Uh, and Don um, has asked for uh, prayers... Um, of thanks because Betty is out of the hospital. She was in the hospital for a little bit and he's uh, grateful for all the prayers that help to support them through that. Uh, Prudy is asking for prayers for her friend Richard who uh, has ongoing recovery from surgery and to pray that he continues to recover. So let us take all of these things, the concerns, the requests for healing, the prayers of gratitude and praise, and the prayer that we might grow closer to our Lord. Let us, in fact, grow closer by having a heart-to-heart -heart with God. Not just speaking our wants and desires, but listening to God's reassurance, listening to God's support, and listening to God's call upon our lives. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, you sent your son Jesus to be a human like us. He knew what it was to grieve. He knew the full range of human emotion. He knew the struggles and he knew the joys and the victories. But above all, he knew you. For in Jesus, he was like us and yet more than us. He was human and your son. And so he is the perfect mediator, the perfect go-between, between your holiness and our fallenness between your love and our selfishness, between your very presence and our frequent seeking to hide ourselves from you. He indeed is the vine. Help us, Lord, to stay connected. 
Feed us from your root that we might bloom and blossom and bear fruit, that we might love the way Jesus taught us to love, that we might trust our whole lives, our families, our friends, our communities, and our world into your care, and that we might live boldly, holding back nothing, knowing that if we serve you faithfully, you will bless these efforts, not because we make them, but because you are leading us. For all those who suffer, who are in pain, who are ill, who are facing death, we ask, Lord, that you give your peace and your strength. For all of those who are rejoicing and celebrating, we ask, Lord, that your joy might fill those celebrations. And for all of us who wander in this world wondering what the next step is, help us, Lord, to always turn to you for guidance. We know that you require us to choose, but may you touch our hearts, may your spirit fill us, that we might have just a piece of your wisdom. And help us in all things, Lord, to stay connected to your Son, to be deeply rooted in his vine, that we might be faithful, that we might serve, that we might witness, that we might give. And so help us, Lord, to follow him, to live in the way that he showed us, and to live our lives as a prayer to you, even as we pray together the prayer that he taught us, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy will be done. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now let us be blessed by the choral anthem, Come to the Water.
Such a wonderful hymn. The prayer of illumination. Loving God, may we find nourishment in the words we hear today, and may we remain rooted and connected in your loving word that we, your disciples, may bear much fruit. Today's scripture readings, first are the responsive reading from Psalms 22, verses 25 to 31. And if the congregation can join me in the responsive portions. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who worship the Lord. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord may praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before the Lord. For dominion belongs to the Lord who rules over the nations. All who sleep in the earth shall bow down to the Lord. All who go down to the dust shall bow before the Lord, and I shall live for God. Posterity shall serve the Lord. Each generation shall tell of the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn. Surely the Lord has done this. And then the next reading is from John. If we could stand, please. This is John 15, verses 1 to 8. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every, he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. So how many of you got poinsettias at Christmas? Are they still alive? We have several, a few years worth of poinsettias accumulated, and most of them at this point just have a few leaves hanging on. One is nothing but green sticks. One looks beautiful, though. But every year I do the same thing since I learned this trick. After all risk of frost has passed, you cut it off to about four to six inches tall. Just chop it off. Put it outside and leave it. Remember to water it in the middle of summer. But then you have a beautiful full plant ready for next Christmas. We even had the miracle this year of one of them blooming. I've never had one bloom that we did that to. But the trick is, you've got to prune it. Now, sometimes pruning can be the wrong thing to do. How many of you know what kudzu is? 
Kudzu is known as the vine that ate the south. Um, with my roots in Mississippi, you would just see these huge vines taking over everything. They always say, don't stand still too long or you will be swallowed alive. And if you, and they come along and they cut the kudzu back every year and it just seems like it makes it grow even more. And then we're probably familiar with grapevines. Those are the vines that Jesus was most likely referencing. And you have to prune grapevines to produce a lot of grapes. Growing up, we had six grapevines in the backyard, and it was my job to prune the grapevines. But it was so counterintuitive to me. I didn't see how cutting away part of the plant could make it grow more. It just felt wrong. You got to preserve it. You have to hold on to it. How is it going to produce grapes if you cut half of the plant away? Well, I wasn't very wise in the ways of growing grapes. So I didn't prune very deeply. And we didn't get many grapes. Once my dad retired and it became his job to prune the grapevines, he cut those things way back. And we always had so many grapes, and Mom made this delicious grape jelly. It was so wonderful. Jesus is talking about the necessity of both staying in the vine, but being pruned. Seems like a, another contradiction to me. Either I'm in the vine, or I'm being pruned. But perhaps the pruning is more about cutting off the parts, letting go of the parts that aren't contributing to making fruit, making room for new growth, making room for new life. There are churches, religious traditions, who have used these verses to kick people out of churches to shun them, to disfellowship them, to excommunicate them when they don't measure up. Personally, I think that's a misunderstanding here. I think Jesus wants everybody to be part of the body of Christ, the church universal, to abide in his vine, to be a part of his vine. But we come to Jesus with all sorts of things that we want to keep in addition to Jesus. We want to keep our opinions. We want to keep our worldly beliefs. We want to keep our preferences. We want to keep our pet sins. We want to keep our politics. We want to keep our vision of what the future should be. But all of those things can be much more like kudzu than they are like a productive grapevine. Rather than bearing fruit, they can strangle the vine that is Jesus in us at our root. When we let all of our, our things take precedence over the vine, Jesus, then we don't bear much fruit. The pruning is letting Jesus remove from us all of the things, not necessarily bad things, but all of the things that keep us from bearing bountiful fruit. In Christ's hands, our preferences, our opinions, our desires, our visions, our politics, it all can serve God's purpose and will in the world. 
but only when we give it to God. Only when we let it dwell in Christ. When we let Jesus transform who we are. But just like when little Jim was afraid to cut too much of the vine, I mean, what if it dies? What if that very branch was the one that was going to produce fruit? I was trying to decide. I was trying to use my wisdom over nature's. And all too often we try to use our wisdom in place of God's. It's scary to cut things out, to cut things off. It hurts sometimes. They tell us that trees and plants actually scream by releasing chemicals that alert other plants that they're being cut. We scream too, don't we? When we don't get our way. When we think that a decision was made that we don't agree with. And we may well be right. But we never know unless we trust God. Perhaps the greatest threat to the church today is holding on to the church of yesterday. As general conferences meeting, they are wrestling with some of these questions, imagining new ways to be the United Methodist Church in the world. And for many people, that's scary. But here's what we know. <clears throat> There's a lot of withering going on in the church. We've experienced it. Our numbers decrease. Our congregations age because we haven't been able to, for whatever reason, bring other people in. We've seen and heard of many churches that have closed because they could no longer sustain themselves. One of the churches that I grew up in died. One of the churches that I served as pastor died. Hopefully not my fault. I think these are churches, faithful, loving, wonderful churches. But they didn't do the pruning. They didn't let go. Instead, they held on. And they held on so tightly that like the kudzu, they strangled the spirit out of the church. It is not my job to tell our churches what decisions we need to make. It's my job to tell us to look to God, to listen to God, to trust God. And to encourage you to take the pruning shears, to be willing to risk cutting the vine back so that we might bear fruit. And then the question is, what does it mean to bear fruit? These metaphors, they can be kind of confusing sometimes. The fruit is the lives that are touched. Now, it would be really nice if that meant for sure that bearing much fruit meant we would have packed sanctuaries. But the truth is, that's not what God has called us to do. God has not called us to pack the church. God has not called us to balance the budget, though we need a balanced budget to do the work that God has called us to but God has called us to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, to show it to the world by our actions, by our faith, by our love. God has called us to reach out into the world and show people's God's love. I believe that when we do that, some of those people would say, gee, I want to be a part of what they're doing. But even if they don't, 
even if none of the people we serve ever sets foot in our church, churches, if we are touching lives, if we are showing people the love of Jesus Christ, and if they are having an encounter with the Lord, because we have introduced them to Jesus, then we have been faithful and fruitful and successful. And whatever comes, well, I will leave it in God's hands. Even though that's hard for me because I want it all to turn out the way I want it to turn out. But God is king. God is wise. God is love. And God is the one who gives us the mission and the call. And God is the one who makes us fruitful. Our job is not to force the issue. Our job is to be obedient and to stay in the vine. Stay connected to Jesus. I pray that any withering that we have done in the past is over. I pray that we are willing to do the pruning that needs to be done, whatever that looks like. And I pray that we grow in our trust of God. That when we put Jesus first, our neighbor second, and ourselves last, that we are indeed in the vine. One of the ways that we share with the world that we are part of the vine, Jesus, is by professing our faith. So in rehearsal for the faith that we live in the world, let us profess together the faith that we share in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and good and a joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You created us to be a part of your garden of paradise. When we selfishly followed our own desires, we cut ourselves off from peace and joy. But your love for us can never be severed. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true vine, and in him we are restored to full participation in the life you created us to enjoy. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, that we might remain in you, so that your love might be perfected in us and the world transformed. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your Spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. It wouldn't be wrong to say that the offering that we give is a kind of pruning. Taking a little bit of what we have and giving it away. Yes, that has to do with the envelopes and our checks. But to really, really give our offering to God, we have to give God our will. We have to give God our preferences and our opinions. We have to give it all to God. Because God is the one with the shears. God is the one who prunes us. We just have to present ourselves to the Lord. So as we receive the offering this morning, 
I invite you to present yourself to God and let God decide what he wants you to keep and what he wants you to let go. Ushers, please come forward. Today, we, we, we reflect on the wisdom and the words from John's Gospel. In this imagery, we recognize our role as branches connected to you, the source of our strength and vitality. Help us to stay rooted in your love, producing fruit that brings glory to your name. May these gifts signify our commitment to abide in your teachings and work joyfully in response to your love. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Please remain standing as you are comfortable as we sing our closing hymn, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee, number 89 in the hymnal.
Amen indeed. In order to stay connected to the vine, and in order to submit ourselves to God doing the pruning that God knows will help us to flourish, that we might open like those flowers to God the Son above. We have covenanted together, agreed to pray daily a prayer for God to break through. This is our offering ourselves to God, that God might do with us as God knows is best. So let us join our voices in prayer. O holy and mighty Redeemer, you act powerfully on behalf of your people. Our old ways no longer serve us, and we feel stuck. Break through our complacency and reluctance as you reveal to us the new thing that you are doing with us. Help us to trust you. Equip us as we make our way down unfamiliar paths into the future that you are calling us to journey toward. Relieve our anxieties about our own future so that we may freely bring your loving grace to others. Amen. One of the things that God always does is surprise. Another thing that God often does, if not always, is call us to move in uncomfortable ways, to speak uncomfortable words, to make decisions that scare us to death, right? Being a follower of Christ in our psalm today referred to refuge. And a refuge is a place of safety, a place where the enemy can't get to you. But I want to be clear God has not called us to be hunkered down in some refuge, hiding from the world. But no, God himself is our refuge. And so he is calling us not to hide, but to go forth. He is calling us to march outward. He is calling us to risk to risk worldly security so that we can be safe and secure in the vine of Jesus Christ. So go in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and know that God is our protector. God is our refuge. Nothing in this world, nothing in religion, nothing in politics, nothing in our families, Nothing in our friendships apart from God can make us safe, nor fruitful, nor holy. Be the people of God. Be fully in the vine. Amen. And enjoy fellowship, and then we will uh, give you some instructions about the town hall.